The year is 1800 BCE, and the Canaanite king of ancient Jerusalem is uneasy. War is approaching. Jerusalem may be built on a hill and have a strong wall, but its main source of water, the Gihon Spring, flows at the bottom of the slope outside the city wall. In the event of war, any enemy could easily take control of the spring and dry the city out. <laughs> the king's chief advisor suggests a simple solution. Change the location of the wall so it includes the spring. What the advisor forgot was the wall was purposely built on the hillside to make it hard for the enemy to reach the city. A wall built lower down would expose the defenders to attack. The king, who remembers these facts, is disappointed with his chief advisor and dismisses him. Another advisor to the king has a different idea. Digging a subterranean tunnel, the spring water would be channeled to the base of a deep shaft formed in the stone. The excavated tunnel would also pass through the stone until it reached the top of the shaft where the city's inhabitants could draw water safely. The enemy, on the other hand, would have no access to the tunnel. The shaft's high vertical walls would be an insurmountable obstacle. The king is pleased, the advisor breathes a sigh of relief, and the project is off and running. This is how scholars used to understand the way Warren's shaft worked. But what was this reconstruction based on? Well, it all began in 1867, when the English captain Charles Warren and his aide, Henry Bertels, entered the Gihon Spring. They crawled for about 20 meters, when suddenly they discovered a breach in the wall, and behind it, the bottom of a vertical shaft that reached a height of 13 meters. Using makeshift scaffolding three stories high, Warren and Bertels climbed up the shaft. Here at the top, they found the rest of the system, a hidden subterranean tunnel, long and winding, rising steeply into the city. Warren put the facts together and concluded that it was a single sophisticated system. It starts inside the city with a sloping tunnel that descends deep into the ground. From there, it continues along a circuitous route until it reaches the shaft here. The shaft is the heart of the system. Using a pulley connected to a ring stuck in the ceiling of the shaft, they could lower and raise a rope with a bucket or water skin and draw water from the shaft. For years, scholars tried to figure out who was behind the unique water system. French scholar Louis Vincent proposed that they were Canaanites, centuries before King David. However, Israeli scholar Igal Shiloh proposed that it was actually a Judean king, a hundred or two hundred years after David. Despite their disagreements, the scholars all agreed on one thing. The vertical shaft which Warren climbed was the heart of the ancient waterworks. And then, along came archaeologists Ronnie Reich and Eli Shukron. In 1995, I was sent here by the Israel Antiquities Authority to conduct a salvage excavation near the spring. I didn't really think we'd find anything special. After all, we're outside the city limits in the valley. But as we dug deeper, we made a breathtaking discovery. Reich and Shukron found remnants of a massive tower that surrounded the Gihon Spring on all sides. These large stones from the tower, which weigh four or five tons each, are the biggest ever used in Jerusalem. Before Herod's time, from the ruins, Reich and Shukron recreated a massive system of fortifications at the foot of the city wall from the Canaanite period. It included a huge tower and a water conduit, the Canaanite conduit, which channeled the waters of the Gihon into a rock-cut Canaanite pool that was discovered nearby. From there, the water was channeled southward to the Shiloach, the Siloam Pool, which was unprotected at the time. It turns out that the Gihon Spring, which everyone thought was unprotected, possessed impressive defenses. 
But if all this is true, why did the Canaanite king and his advisor draw water from a dark, narrow subterranean shaft when right next door was a spring and a large pool? All excellently protected. Well, the new excavations indicate that they didn't. As the dig proceeded, our understanding of Warren's shaft changed. We concluded that the vertical shaft had nothing to do with ancient Jerusalem's water system. The marks left by tools on the walls of the tunnel indicate that the Canaanite workers carved it out on both sides, but they concentrated on just the upper part of the rock. As we can clearly see here, and on the other side, in other words, this part, the hard part of the rock, was the tunnel floor. This stone floor continued, covering the whole area. So, when the Canaanites carved out their waterworks, they didn't know about the shaft. But just a minute, the tunnel protected the water drawers as long as they were underground. But what protected them when they came out to the exposed slope on the way to the fortified spring? two enormous walls descending eastward toward the tower. They created a protected passageway down to the Canaanite pool where one could draw water safely. Thus, the Canaanite king wasn't disappointed by his architect's design. The city dwellers went down through the underground tunnel to the slope, and from there they continued through the protected passageway to the fortified spring and pool. The Gihon Spring, the beating heart of Jerusalem. All of the city's ancient water systems were fed by the spring. There are still many unanswered questions concerning Jerusalem and water, but one thing is clear. The impressive fortified Canaanite water system discovered here tells the story of Jerusalem in its early days. It sheds light on the rich, developed Canaanite culture in the times before the Israelites entered the land of Israel.